March 3rd, 1982. This letter was written from Sue Bailey Thurman to Cousin Chris. Dear Cousin Chris, These are some notes on your Uncle Isaac, remembered across a span of years. I was 10 years old when he died in 1914. So many of his early experiences were conveyed to me through casual conversations with my mother. His was a quiet presence, but presence it was. I never heard anybody call him Isaac, not his relatives, his peers, his wife, not a single person. My mother called him dear or darling. There was no other address. Perry, his father, was an older man when he, Isaac, was born, we must conclude. Perry, perhaps, was as old as 54 to 55. He, Isaac, did attend the Branch Normal College and was a student under Professor J. H. Corbin. He was deeply involved in establishing churches in the Delta districts before ever considering taking the brief venture into politics. Somewhere along the way, he met Dr. E. C. Morris, who became president of the National Baptist Convention Incorporated for some 30 or 40 years. As young men, they were close. I do remember a letter Dr. Morris sent him. It may have been during his Bailey's illness, saying he wished both of them could go back to the years when they were playing E.C. Morris and I.G. Bailey, enjoying their youth together. Did E.C. Morris attend Ranch Normal? There is a vague recollection, as though someone told me in the dead of the night, that my father and Frederick Douglass met only once. The time the latter came to Little Rock for a grand appearance, it seems they enjoyed the meeting. What transpired, we'll never know. What a pity. His leadership was reflected in community life covering a broad area. After the Southeast Baptist Academy was established, soon came the Industrial Chronicle, an organ of the Southeast Baptist Association edited and published by the SEBA. My brother Isaac, then a freshman at Howard University, was the editor, or it may well be that he took the post before he graduated from the academy. Isaac Jr. ran a tight ship. His paper came out on time and he carried ads from every barbershop, pressing shop, church, or church-related institution in Southeast Arkansas. Getting the paper out, i.e. folding, addressing, mailing, became an all-inclusive, every-member project of the Bailey household. I think my brother paid us five cents an hour. There hangs a tale relating to one important issue, the most cru crucial and decisive of any year. The Baileys were always very proud of ourselves because we were proud of the qualities we inherited from our race. Isaac's spirit ran over with this pride as witness. One hot summer day in Dermont, Three white women were walking along the main street, taking up all the sidewalk. A black girl visiting from Mississippi approached them, coming in the opposite direction. They bumped into each other in passing shoulders rubbed against each other. The husband of one of the white women came charging up and boxed the black girl's ears until she fell bleeding in the street. The incident may have passed off as ordinary, not surprising for the South and soon forgotten. But Isaac, Isaac Jr. happened to be at that corner at that time, so it could never be an ordinary incident. He went back to his printing office and whipped off an editorial that came out that very afternoon. It ran thus. A disgraceful incident occurred on the streets of Dermont today with which every citizen with any pride in his community will take offense. 
a young visitor from Mississippi was struck down on the street because she dared to pass a group of women who blatantly refused to share the sidewalk. What must the visitor think of us? The next day, the white community was up and in arms. Bailey would have to be lynched. He had insulted white womanhood and referred to the Mississippi girl as a lady. E.P. Rimley, the banker, the postmaster, all the wealthy planters, etc., were outraged with the Bailey boy's insolence, unheard of, daring, and arrogance. Father Bailey was sick in bed at the time, unaware of what had happened. One of Mama's white women friends connected with the leading church came out to see her and report the crises fast coming on the town. Soon, word came to Father Bailey from a secret white messenger that he would have to get up out of bed with a fever of 103 to 104 and come to town, going to every important office of the above-named town and try to stay the lynching. I remember how my mother helped him dress and bolstered his arm as he got into his buggy alone. He managed to make the rounds, but fainted when he returned home. That night, my mother went to see the mother of the young man who had accosted the black girl. It seems she too had met Mama Bailey in some church connection. By this time, the mob was expected to come to our house by midnight. So this meeting of the mothers was the only real hope left. The other mother promised she would do what she could to calm down her white men folks. Mama returned and we waited. Finally, a spokesman was sent to tell my father that Isaac Jr. would have to get out of town before daybreak, that the mood was ugly and out of control. The good citizens had been joined by the riffraff spoiling for a fight. There was a late night train to Little Rock. Now, what was your cousin Isaac doing during all this time? going calmly about the house, loading every shelf and drawer with shells. He was not cavalier, not debonair, nor overconfident with age. He was getting ready to protect himself and his family, and he was a crack shot. One of Papa's favorite deacons had taught Isaac to shoot from childhood. Back to the story. The National Negro Businessmen's League was meeting in Hot Springs the very time this happened. Isaac Jr. was a photographer. Grasping this moment, Father Bailey called his friend E.C. Morris, an important member of the League, telling him the situation. Would the League like a photographer? He could come up on the morning train. There would have to be a good reason or else Ike, as everybody called Isaac Jr., would refuse to be lured away. Send him immediately, Morris replied, and I would have him begin this assignment at once. By daybreak, young Isaac was on his way to Hot Springs. Once there, he took several memorable photographs, historically memorable. I think uh, Bruce the Wizard might find one of them in which Booker T. Washington, Emmett J. Scott, Morris, and others are on the first row. After the meeting, Morris took Isaac Jr. to Helena and kept him there with his sons until Papa gave him the signal that all was clear and Isaac Jr. could return to his fortress at home. Isaac Jr. left soon for Howard University, returning only at the death of a family member until at last Mama and I brought his body home from Washington to be buried at Spring Grove beside Isaac Sr., head of the Klan. This tells you much about the lengthening shadow. He was the foremost man in position to fight for his own people. Ike Jr.'s dramatic case was not the only one where my father went from door to door to door, encountering leaders of the lynch mob, robed in the garb of bankers, lawyers, realtors, planters, etc. At my father's funeral, the city officials attending called him the great mediator for his people. He was absolutely
absolute fearless and his children and brother's children were taught the same courage. For us, it was courage under another kind of stress. He was an exemplar of courage under the racial and personal strains and stresses of both his day and ours. His faith in God and the imperative of his leadership of black people under God made him kind and wise. He returned the widow's church dues with the assurance that her very presence was greater than any financial dues could estimate. He encouraged his congregants to buy land, own property, educate themselves, and educate their children. Since his death in 1914, hundreds of youth have gone forth seeking secondary and higher education, many remaining in Arkansas to become a vital part of that ever-lengthening shadow. Your cousin, Mrs. Sue Bailey Thurman. Here in the ATL, ready to do research at Emory.